To Kill a Mockingbird, Reader's Digest Condensed Version, Chapter 1. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed, and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right, but he couldn't have cared less, so long as he could pass and punt. After enough years had gone by, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintained that the disgraceful Yule started it all, but Jim, who was four years my senior, said it began the summer our friend Dill came to visit and first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out of the house he hadn't left in years. I said if he wanted to take a broad view, the whole thing really began with Andrew Jackson, if he hadn't run the Creek Indians up the creek, our ancestor Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama River, and where would we be if he hadn't? Simon Finch was a fur trapper who established a homestead some 40 miles above St. Stephen's. His descendants remained at Finch's Landing and made their living from cotton until well into the 20th century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law and his younger brother Jack went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, he settled in Maycomb, the county seat of Maycomb County, 20 miles east of Finch's Landing. For some years, he invested his earnings in his brother's medical education, but after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He knew his people, and they knew him. He was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was a tired old town when I first knew it in the 30s. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square and shuffled in and out of the stores. A day was 24 hours long but seemed longer. There was no hurry, or there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and no money to buy it with. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. Somehow, it was hotter then. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts, flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon, after their three o'clock naps, and by not nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. We lived on the main residential street in town, Atticus Jim and I, plus Calpurnia, our cook. Calpurnia had been with us for as long as I could remember. She was all angles and bones. She squinted. Her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jim and calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won. Our mother had died when I was two. I never felt her absence, but Jim did. He remembered her clearly, and his soft brown hair and eyes and oval face were like hers. Sometimes in the middle of a game he would sigh, then go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jim was 10, our summertime boundaries, within calling distance of Calpurnia, were Miss DuBose's house two doors to the north of us and the Radley place three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley place was inhabited by an unseen human entity, the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Ms. DuBose, when we went near, would rake us with a wrathful graze and shout a melancholy prediction of what we would amount to when we grew up. That was the summer Dill came to us. One morning, as we were beginning our play in the backyard, Jim and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collared patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting, it wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey.
Hey yourself, said Jim pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. You got anything needs reading, I can do it. How old are you? asked Jim. Four and a half? Going on seven. Shoot, no wonder then, said Jim, jerking his thumb at me. Scout yonder's been reading ever since she was born, and she ain't even started school. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, Jim said. Lord, what a name. It's not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jim scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, and he was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel. His mother had entered his picture in a beautiful child contest in Meridian and won five dollars. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show 20 times on it. Don't have any picture shows here, except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jim. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula. Tell it to us, Jim said. Dill wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His snow white hair was like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale, his blue eyes lightened and darkened, and his laugh was sudden and happy. When he had reduced Dracula to dust, I asked Dill where his father was. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Well, then if he's not dead, you've got one, haven't you? Jim told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. We came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin, whose head teemed with eccentric plans and quaint fancies. By the end of August, we had completed improvements on our treehouse between the twin chinaberry trees in the backyard. And it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings, it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house, once white, had long ago darkened to the slate gray of the yard around it, and rain-rotted shingles drooped over the eaves. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. Jim and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down and peeped in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. A Negro would not pass the Radley place at night, and though the school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot, a baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jim and I were born. The Radleys and their two sons were welcome anywhere in town, but they kept to themselves, a predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, make home's principal recreation. Miss Radley seldom, if ever, crossed the street for mid-morning coffee with her neighbors. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living, but Jim said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing. The shutters and doors of the house were closed on Sundays, though in Maycomb, closed doors on Sunday meant only illness or cold weather. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy, Arthur, was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams, an enormous and confusing tribe from Old Sarum in the northern part of the county, and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They hung around the barber shop, they attended dances at the Dewdrop Inn, the county's gambling hell. They experimented with stump hole whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had the nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that Arthur was in with the wrong crowd. 
One night, in a spurt of high spirits, the boys backed around the square in a borrowed fiver, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beetle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. They came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct and assault and battery. The judge decided to send them to the state industrial school. But Mr. Radley promised that if the judge released Arthur, he would see to it that the boy gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. After that, Arthur, boo, Radley, was not seen again for 15 teen years. Then there came a day, barely within Jim's memory, when Boo Radley was seen by several people. Atticus would never talk much about the Radleys. He told Jim to mind his business and let the Radleys mind theirs. So Jim received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold. According to Miss Stephanie, Boo was sitting in the living room, cutting some items from the Maycomb Tribune to paste in his scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, Boo drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out, wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the street, but when the sheriff arrived, he found Boo still sitting in the living room cutting up the Tribune. He was 33 years old then. When it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo, old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum. Boo wasn't crazy. He was high strung at times. Nobody knew how Mr. Radley kept Boo out of sight after that, but Jim figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to a bed most of the time. Atticus said no, that there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, then pour water on her canas. We saw Mr. Radley's elder son, Nathan, only at Christmas. He lived in Pensacola. But every day, Jim and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin, ramrod straight man with colorless eyes and sharp cheekbones. He never spoke to us. When he passed, we would say, good morning, sir, and he would cough in reply. But there came a day when Atticus told us Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it, but at last we watched him make his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man ever God blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia rarely commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under, Boo would come out. But it had another thing coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was that Mr. Nathan would speak to us when we said good morning. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know. I wonder what he does in there he would murmur. Looks like he just stick his head out the door. Jim said, he goes out all right when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up one time and saw him looking through the window at her. Ain't you ever heard him at night, Dill? He walks like this. Jim slid his feet through the gravel. And one night I heard him scratching on the screen. Wonder what it looks like said Dill. Jim gave a reasonable description. Boo was six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks. He dined on raw squirrels and cats. His teeth were yellow, his eyes popped. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. Jim said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jim a copy of Secretary Hawkins, The Great Ghost, against two Tom Swifts that Jim wouldn't get farther than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jim had never declined a dare, but he stood so long in thought that Dill said, You're scared. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Let me think a minute. Dill finally said, 
I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jim brightened. Touch the house? That all? Dill nodded. Yeah, he'll probably come out after you when he sees you in the yard. Then Scout and me will jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't gonna hurt him. We went down the street and stopped at the Radley gate. Well, go on, said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going, said Jim. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner, then back again, studying the simple terrain, frowning, scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jim threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm, and ran back at us. Dill and I followed on his heels. Safe on our porch, panting, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick. But as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick, a tiny, almost invisible movement, and the house was still. Dill left us in September to return to Meridian. I was miserable without him, until it occurred to me that I would be starting school in a week. I never looked forward more to anything in my life. Jim condescended to take me to school that first day. At the edge of the schoolyard, he explained that during school hours, I was not to bother him. You mean we can't play anymore? I asked. At home, we'll do like we always do, he said. But you'll see, school's different. It certainly was. Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair, pink cheeks, and wore high-heeled pumps and a red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. The first morning, Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard and said, this says, I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama, from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively. When Alabama ceded from the Union in 1861, Winston County ceded from Alabama and every child in Maycomb knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. Miss Caroline began the day by printing the alphabet in enormous capitals on the blackboard. She asked, does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed it last year. She chose me, and as I read the alphabet, a faint line appeared between her eyebrows. After making me read most of my first reader, she discovered that I was literate and looked at me with distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me any more. It's best, she said, to begin reading with a fresh mind. I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage. I retired, meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned to read.